The splash was an idea that Brian uh, had, uh, had developed. I created what I thought was the perfect girl by definition and then assigned a symbol to that girl and that symbol was a mermaid. And the most important thing was not only was beauty in, in the exterior and beauty in spirit. He'd gotten a screenplay written, but the screenplay was a little awkward, wasn't really working very well, and, and it kept getting put into turnaround. The idea was interesting enough that studios would invest a little money and time in it, and then they'd kind of let go of it. And, that, and that's where it was, it was in limbo. Every person in the world had turned this, that people who didn't even have movie studios, <laughs> just like, like people who were we, we shopping, people would turn this, this, this picture down. And then he started talking to Ron about it while we were making Night Shift. And, they said, well, let's, let's see if, what, what the boys think. We'd had such a good creative relationship with, with Lowell and Bob Lou that Brian said, why don't we just all go to work on Splash? And, you know, the screenplay really clicked. It was developed, redeveloped at the same company where we had, had done Night Shift, the Lad Company, um, for Warner Brothers. And they were very happy with the script, and it seemed like they were going to make it. And then another mermaid movie appeared with, and it appeared having all of the sort of Hollywood weight you could possibly have. It had a star producer in Race Dark, and had Warren Beatty involved, and Herbert Ross was the director, and Robert Town was the writer. And it was so overpowering to our little mermaid movie, Splash, that ours got put into turnaround, and it, it's, it had no home. Brian, at this moment, kicked into a gear that sort of defines him as a successful producer and among the elite in his field. It became kind of a David and Goliath story. And uh, I was the little David. And the Goliath was this other mermaid movie. I always thought it was, uh, it said something about Brian, you know, the fact that, you know, every studio kind of turned them down on this movie. I will never, ever give up on an idea that I love. So in the case of Splash, it was an idea that I was in love with, and I just wouldn't let anyone break me down. Finally, we went to Disney. I mean, Disney was a pretty sleepy studio at that point. I mean, it really felt, if it was like the land that time forgot, you'd, you'd like drive on there and you like, you felt like it looked exactly as it must have looked in like 1941. I mean, the question was like, do you see it as a talkie, Mr. Howard? <laughs> you know, was, and, and they were just so eager. They were, they were kind of like so excited that somebody was bringing them uh, anything. <laughs> and then they said, now what about this other movie, Mermaid? Ron and I said, we're gonna make our movie cheaper, faster, better than the other movie. That was a guarantee I could make. And Disney believed in us. We had a deal the next day to, to make Splash. Disney at that time was clearly branded only Disney, mostly G-rated films, and Ron was afraid that um, his movie would get recut. I assured him it wouldn't get recut, even though I, how could I know? They were used to sort of seeing the Disney fair um, of that time, and the live action stuff was more like Gus the field goal kicking mule, and um, you know, the fifth installment of Herbie. And here was something that was a bit more adult. Then they had to decide, do they want, can they put the Disney name on a, on a PG movie? Michael Eisner had then taken over Disney and was excited by Splash. They came up with the notion of actually starting another uh, label. They had to create Touchstone Pictures in order to um, release the film because they, they didn't want um, di the Disney name to be associated with something, you know, as scandalous as, you know, my naked bottom. <laughs> Ron Miller was running the studio, then he had a career as like a USC football player. My joke was is that Ron Miller wanted it to be called Touchdown Pictures, but he was misunderstood, and <laughs> so it came as, uh, as Touchstone. I thought it was neat that uh, whatever the movie was going to do was going to be the very first film underneath this new kind of banner, which has since gone off to be you know, incredibly successful and profitable. I love that it launched Touchstone. Um, and in fact, Michael will, will still say to me, your movie was the first movie that launched Touchstone. Make another movie for us. The list of terrific, entertaining actors who, who passed 
um, on on the movie is is is, uh, is still a little depressing. Everybody who was an A-list movie star at the time was offered Splash at Disney, directed by Ronnie Howard, which you know that that had that would have all the impact as say, guess what? They're making a movie called The Boat Nicks at Disney. Brian had met Tom Hanks as a candidate for uh, the part that John Candy ultimately played, Freddie, the brother. You know, we had thought that, uh, you know, if Michael Keaton or, or John Travolta, um, you know, played, played the part, a couple of actors who we were very interested in, who were showing some interest, then, um, you know, Tom Hanks might be, a, might be a good candidate for the brother. At the same time, Hanks did a guest shot on Happy Days, which I, I had left the show uh, as an actor, but Gans and Mandel were still sort of uh, consulting on the show. My series had been canceled. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 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 they, I just kind of like got this call to say, "Would you like to do this thing?" And uh, on Happy Days, and I look, I needed, it. I needed the work, so I, and I wasn't doing anything. And then he showed up as this this guy who spent his entire life wanting seeking revenge. He wanted on, to beat up Fonzie. He wanted to beat up Fonzie since he was a kid and was thrown pushed off a swing by but Fonzie. But he was so funny. And he just he was just so funny. I waited for this moment. The yoke has finally been lifted. I feel. So We recommended him, and Ron's assistant, Louisa, had loved Bosom Buddies. And she kept saying, he's funny, he's cute, you're gonna, you gotta see, you've gotta see some episodes. And one day she got hold of some tapes and made me sit down and look at these episodes. And of course, you know, I'd heard how good he was, but here I watched, you know, parts of three episodes. His timing was just impeccable, he was great. He came in and auditioned one day. I went to Disney, and this was old Disney, you know, uh, the Disney Studios, in which the whole, you know, there's no, it's a very kind of grim place. It was kind of empty and abandoned. I went on a rainy day, and it was truly a downpour. It was a deluge that was going on, and I was sort of like ran inside some side door of some low-slung bungalow that hadn't been painted for a while, walked down some dark, abandoned hallways, and uh, came upon uh, Brian Grazer's office. He should have been nervous because he was just a guy off a TV series. Right off the bat, I felt comfortable, number one, because the production office was so so tacky, <laughs> and number two, uh, Brian seemed like a regular guy as opposed to some imposing, you know, uh, Hollywood uh, uh, stereotypical uh, producer. You would think he'd exude complete nervousness, you know, and that, like, I want this job stuff, but he didn't, and I was always curious about that. Ron came in uh, after a while, and in and it was a bit intimidating because I had never met Ron. So here suddenly is, you know, Opie Cunningham. And I uh, chatted with him a little bit. And uh, that was it. I wasn't there, I don't think, more, for more than 40 minutes or so. And was told that I needed to prepare um, the audition pieces. Hey, Alan. She left me, OK? She's not coming back. She moved out. My life's a shambles, OK? That's the news. You want the weather? Anywhere but the first three rows. And I remember thinking, well, you know, nobody's gonna go to a Tom Hanks movie, but if you just care about casting the role, you couldn't get anybody better. Uh, are, are, you, uh, are you, are you from Cape Cod? Oh, no, no, I'm from another place. Oh, oh yeah? I got a cousin from there. Uh. <laughs> when he walked out, Ron and I said, this is our guy, let's just get him. I'm glad everybody said no. So they got me, uh, they got me with all the enthusiasm in the world. Once we'd cast Tom Hanks, who wasn't a named comedian, it became very important, especially to Brian, to have a big comedy name in the movie. I kept saying, well, John Candy, I love him, he's talented, but they don't look anything like brothers. And Brian kept saying, you just forget, don't worry. What matters is, you know, if he's funny, that's all I care about. He was so right. There goes. Ah, yeah! Tom Hanks was elated when he found out he was gonna be acting with John Candy and then Eugene Levy. I had been watching John in the way that fanatics watch uh, TV shows for about two and a half years on Second City. I think Ron Howard's a, a rough man to work for. I can't stand him, uh, his family. I think Tom Hanks, with all his problems, couldn't act his way out of a paper bag. Daryl Hannah, one of the few people I enjoyed on that, that entire film and they wouldn't let me work with her. This movie would not have worked had it not 
been for Daryl. I mean, Daryl's uh, ethereal quality. I mean, she's a woman of mystery, absolutely. I had been um, sort of obsessed with the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale Little Mermaid ever since I was a kid and um, fantasized about being one myself since I was little, tied my feet together in the pool and practiced swimming like that from a very early age. Daryl I'd seen in Blade Runner and I loved how she looked. I thought there was an iconography in in her presence. I didn't want the mermaid, Madison, to be an object. I really wanted her to be a noble character, powerful in her own right, and really worthy of deep love. And this is what Brian, you know, always had in mind as well, um, just as long as the girl was hot, too, which, I, you know, certainly no problem in casting Daryl Hannah. I just fell in love with her lips and her eyes, and I thought she had to be the mermaid. And I got amazing resistance. It was unrelenting, actually. And they said, no, you can't hire her. So we did a screen test. Why didn't you speak to me before this? I didn't know English. And now you do? Yeah, I learned it from television. It's wonderful. Now I can ask you questions. And if you answer them correctly, you can win one of these valuable prizes, an attractive wall clock, a matching washer and dryer set, or a brand new car. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let and me I said, first, she's okay? perfect for the mermaid, because the mermaid had to have a simplicity. Yeah. And she also had to have, have a quality that forced your eyes to her. Ultimately, you know, they just said no, and the studio boss at the time went, um, had to go to um, Switzerland, I believe. And so once he took off on an airplane, I just pulled the trigger and hired her. The first read-through we had for it in which John Candy was there, I mean, everybody was there, Eugene Levy, who I was such a fan of from the SCTV TV days. I just remember John and I drove up to the first read-through together. And I think we were more excited, I think the most exciting thing was working with Ron, because it was like, he was like, a, you know, at that time was like a living legend, having had a career since he was two. And I was just a guy on a TV show. I really felt as though here at this read-through around the table, I was going to have to score just like I had to score when I was doing Bosom Buddies. I had to make jokes sell. I had to get laughs. I had to have a lot of energy. I had to be really pumped up. And for me, anyway, the read-through was a disaster because nothing I did worked. And then it sort of like developed a flop sweat and tried to push it even harder. And uh, um, I actually, I mean, as I thought often in the course of making the movie, I thought, okay, well, that's it. I've just blown the job. I'm going to get fired. I remember we left and we just said, boy, this is going to be great, you know? He seems like a... You know, this Tom, this Tom Hanks guy seems like a regular uh, guy, and he's kind, he's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, he's kind of funny. Yeah, I think it's going to be good. Yeah, I think it's going to be good, too. But Ron, literally, that day, I mean, literally, he took me aside, and he said, listen, I know what you're doing. I know that you're pushing really hard. I know you think that there's some way you can score with laughs or moments in this thing, and you're not going to be able to do it. John Candy is here. Eugene Levy, they're going to get a lot of good laughs. What you have to do is love the girl. You have to love the girl. And if we don't believe that you love the girl, then we don't have a movie. So, okay, I'm thinking, okay, here's my first official day working on this film, and I've already been chastised by the director for not doing a good job. He was such a sweetheart, and I remember when we were filming, too, he would always, like, almost on a daily basis, make derogatory comments about himself and how he would never work again. <laughs> the set was just fun. I mean, Hanks is a gr great guy to hang around with. And John Candy and Eugene Levy, hilarious. We were about to shoot the scene where John comes in and we're trying to, st we're trying to steal the, mer the, uh, the mermaid. John had to fly in from Canada. It was right after a very tragic air disaster occurred for Air Canada. So he had to fly on Air Canada <laughs> in uh, that morning, go right from the airport to the, uh, to, the, to the set and shoot the film. Now, John didn't like to fly anyway, so let's just say he had had a few cocktails on the plane. So John came to work that morning uh, you know, just kind of smashed. Good afternoon, Dr. Kornbluth. He had to immediately, when he got there, work with this Swedish oh, dialect cool coach right. to learn the Swedish for the scene. The first two Swedish words in, in his speech when he, when he hits the guards was uh, like, hey, roaring, and then he had a whole mouthful of Swedish. Hey, roaring. He could never get past, hey, roaring without tripping up. 
It was so funny that, that everybody was laughing so hard at just watching him just try to get through the course of this day that sooner or later everybody broke, ruined a take by laughing. Eugene would ruin a take, but I would ruin a take, John would ruin a take, Ron would start laughing. I think my lip was actually bleeding from from biting it because every time John came on and started his Swedish, we just, we would have to look away. Because one time, literally the boom operator, he couldn't take it. All you could see was, you know, these guys, the crew were laughing so hard waiting for John to, to screw up, which he did. Hey, Rory, you're going to turf and, uh, in Tom's penis. There was something about the film that was very challenging, but, not that stressful. Yeah, I know where you are is good. It was uh, one of the top three or four filmmaking experiences of, uh, of my life, just in terms of having a, a joyous, creative time while going to work each day. I got to learn how to scuba dive for free. Well, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. I, mean, I would have done this on vacation, and here I'm going, they're gonna pay me to go off uh, and do this. Uh, and when we were in the three weeks of shooting in the Bahamas, I, you know, I'd leave the hotel room in nothing more than a t-shirt and a you know, bathing suit. And that it was actually quote unquote work for me. I thought, well, hey man, if all jobs are like this in movies, sign me up, I, I'm, I'm ready to do it. The only time that I found it stressful was when I had to eat the lobster. <laughs> because I've been a vegetarian since I was 11. And um, I pick up the lobster to take a bite out of it. And it does this thing that I didn't expect. As I lift it, it kind of wilts in my hand. It kind of got scared and I threw it down and screamed a little bit, you know, I'm like, oh, you know. And She's really hungry. And they were like, well, what are we gonna do? You know, we can't, they couldn't make a fake lobster. So we had to end up stuffing it with leeks and potatoes. And they had a big bucket. Uh, at the end of every take, and she'd have to, you know, dump it all in, into, in, you know, into the bucket. And still to this day, I cannot eat a leek because every time that I taste a leek, I'd be like, that's a lobster. We found with Daryl Hannah that she was so capable of swimming beautifully and holding her breath and not allowing bubbles to, to escape that. Uh, she could actually exert herself and hold her breath and act for up to 60 seconds. Ron, you know, had wanted to hire a body double to do all of my stunt stuff, and I'm like, oh, I can dive, and they're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and then um, we um, went to this pool in downtown Los Angeles because it had a window um, underneath it so that Ron could s watch the girls swim, and he had me come down so that he could match our body types. I had my mermaid swim down because I'd been doing it since I was a little tiny kid, you know? And so all of these girls who were trying to do a mermaid swim, I'm like, I'm like, no, sorry, it's just not gonna work. <laughs> that is so not right. And and Ron was just in the end like, this is ridiculous. What are we hiring a stunt double for? She can hold her breath longer, swim faster. We developed these hand signals, uh, you know, one more time, hold. And this is the camera and this is, you know, what you're supposed to do. So if the camera's here and you want to swim up to it and then go over it or go under it, or and, and sometimes they use a little grease pencil on a board, but usually the sign language works, you know. If he wants, he goes, you watch me, and that means that he'll show you what he wants you to do. And then, of course, there's the actual universal sign language, which is, which is give me my air. For me, it wasn't so bad, because at least, you know, I could, I could swim, I could drop the iron weights out of my pants and swim somewhere, but Daryl was in that tail. She couldn't get anywhere. They could only take her out of the water on this kind of like chaise lounge that they tied ropes to that they'd hold on and she'd climb on and they'd lift her out. I mean, I got to, I got to essentially, you know, sit in the sun and have a sandwich for lunch and she had to lay down in a, you know, her legs, you know, wrapped up in, a, in shrink wrap. It was between five and eight hours to put it on. It was very, very tight. And at first, when we were shooting, they would, um, you know, take me out for lunch and, but I just have to lay there. I couldn't, wa I couldn't move, I couldn't go to the bathroom. I couldn't walk around, so I couldn't eat anything. I couldn't drink anything. And I just lay there and kind of be in pain all the time. So um, after for the first few days, they ended up just leaving me in the tank or letting me like stay in the ocean and kind of hang around the side of the boat like a, you know, like a dolphin or something. You know, I'd be like, 
and sometimes, occasionally, Ron would drop a little French fry in my mouth or something, you know? The underwater scenes were pretty ambitious um, because um, there's real acting there. We had a pretty complicated scene that we cut out, a sequence, Daryl Hannah is startled by this, this, we called her the sea hag, who gave her the rules. It broke my heart because it was very hard to direct and I was proud of the sequence, but by removing it, there was a little more mystery about her. And, and we, we still would learn the rules um, as the film unfolded. And that actually created more sort of comedic tension and, uh, and made the story uh, sort of unfold in a more interesting way. I really wanted to approach it as a legitimate love story. I wanted it to really be about the kind of love that I had felt, you know, when I met my wife in high school. The kind of love that just sweeps over you and takes over and you just know is, um, is right, it means everything. In lesser hands, a movie about a mermaid is just a kooky kind of fake movie. And in a weird way, Splash is not a fake movie. As strong as the idea is, a man falling in love with a mermaid, could be its weakness as well. And what Ron was able to do was, um, because he breathed such artistic humanity into all of the characters and into ultimately into the heartbeat or the spirit of the piece, we got the very best out of a very high concept idea. It has a realism to it that you fall, you fall into. You believe everything that you're seeing. People laugh, but I know people cried by the end. The, ro the romance, I think, hit people pretty hard. The night it opened, one of the, one of the thrills of my professional life, I, I, I have to say. We got our favorite theater. I really always wanted to be in the AFCO because the AFCO theater is right on Wilshire Boulevard. And you really, and you get a sense, is your movie a hit or a flop? Because there's either a line or no line and it's visible from one of the busiest streets in Los Angeles. It was emotional to see that people were not only there, but they were, they were lined up around the block we got out of our car, we ran around the block and ran to the very end of the line and looked at people's faces and, and then we needed the reaffirmation of what movie are you, are you seeing? And they said Splash. And we started visiting other theaters and they were all like either sold out or 95% full. It was uh, one of the most exhilarating moments of my professional career. It's kind of a, I mean, uh, to be as corny as possible, it's kind of a dream come true, you know, you're writing all those years and, and uh, suddenly it's it's your movie that's the that's the thing the best thing for me about that was little kids you know I just love and even to this day like when they come up to me and they're like you know Madison you know and plus I've also met I think like hundreds, literally hundreds of kids named Madison. <laughs> they want to go swimming with me or, you know, they want, I just love that. I just think that it's so nice. The odds are always against you making a good movie. And the odds are really against you by having a good time <laughs> making a movie. Like a great vacation you had, uh, you'd like to pull out the pictures every now and again and remember how pleasant it was and remember how young everybody was and how the goodness of the experience uh, is still alive somehow. A film is forever. The other mermaid movie with all the big stars and everything never got made.